Thank you for all coming this afternoon to our uh, Friday Jones seminar. We're pleased to have with us this afternoon Professor Leidy Klotz. Uh, professor Klotz is the Copenhagen Associate Professor at the University of Virginia, where he has a joint appointment across engineering, architecture, and business. His scholarship spans engineering and behavioral science in pursuit of more sustainable energy systems. He has published more than 65 peer-reviewed articles on the built environment and energy engineering, design, and engineering education, as well as imprints in both science and nature. Through his research, Professor Klotz adv advises organizations including the Department of Energy, the World Bank, and the nonprofit design firm Ideas42, which uses behavioral insights to solve complex social problems. Professor Klotz is the author of the book, Sustainability Through Soccer, An Unexpected Approach to Saving Our World. An award-winning teacher and mentor, Professor Klotz works closely with students in his courses and through an open online course that he's developed that has led to energy in innovation projects on three continents. We're pleased to have him with us today. Please join me in welcoming. So thank you. It's, it's great to be here. And I've really enjoyed the, the hospitality for the last couple of days. And I think you've got a really um, unique and important thing going here at um, Dartmouth Engineering. So um, I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, as we go through the presentation, I'd just like you to think about this question that's on the, on the screen behind me, which holds more promise for transforming energy frontiers, um, engineering or behavior? And uh, I should disclose my biases first, then, before we proceed. Um, my, uh, I'm a, an engineer by, by upbringing. I'm number 34 in the picture here. Um, and the guy in the white hat next to me is my grandfather. He, he bounced radar beams off of Venus. So he's like an MIT-trained engineer. Um, his, uh, one of his sons was an engineering professor at UNH, which is you know, still pretty good, right? And, uh, my, there's some other engineers in the picture. My mom is the, the engineer's engineer. She, she beat Tetris. She described her childhood phone number as two to the eighth power. Um, it was 0256. Um, my grandmother, who's 99 years old and who I got to visit on the way coming up here, um, she taught high school math in, in 1942, right? So this is like, um, the, the engineering was um, bred into me. I didn't really have much of a choice in what I was gonna be when I grew up. And then my dad, um, this is a picture from, I guess it would be the, the mid 80s, and he was already exasperated by, by climate change, and so that's where the kind of environmental impact came in. Um, so, so I'm an engineer by, you know, by, by upbringing, um, and then I've got you know, engineering education, engineering experience, and time as an engineering um, professor. It's, it's a huge part of my identity, so as we go into this question about engineering or behavior, I need to disclose that as a bias. Um, I've often focused on how we, um, how we engineer through, um, through the built environment. Uh, I think you know, this may be review for some people, but it's worth saying that like, the built environment systems directly influence more than half of global energy use between buildings and uh, transportation. Um, and, and they set in place this energy use for a long period of time, right? So these are things that we, um, you know, the buildings that we're in now were built a long time ago. The buildings that we're building now will last for a long time. It's the same with the, with the infrastructure. And there's a couple of side benefits of studying these types of systems is that everybody experiences the built environment, right? So it's like in terms of a touch point for engineering, um, that is something that is, is, is relevant to people who don't maybe consider themselves engineers. Um, another key point with the built environment here is that this is not something that some you know, isolated engineer is sitting off in, a, in an office designing, right? If you're talking about energy systems and, um, and grids and, and things like that, everybody is engineering these systems, right? You're, you're insulating your house, you're, you're voting on infrastructure, um, you're con contributing to community dialogues about um, you know, whether we should do climate engineering, what types of climate engineering is appropriate or not appropriate. Um, so this is not, I'm gonna use the term engineering, but I mean it in the broadest notion. It's all types of engineers, but it's also something that people do that may not consider themselves engineers. Um, my, uh, you know, the issue in built environment systems is not so much that we 
don't know what to do. It's just that we're not doing it. Um, or not that maybe it's less that, yeah, that, that's a fair way of saying it. So this building on the, um, is it, it's the, the left side of the screen there, is, it's an office building of a construction company in New Jersey, and it's a net zero energy building. So the point is, if, if construction companies in New Jersey are figuring out a way to do net zero energy buildings, there must be, it must be like not an entirely revolutionary um, idea. Uh, and that's net zero, um, and I think that's great, but even if every building we built right, is, is a net zero energy building, you're still not doing anything to reduce overall um, CO2 emissions or, or these things that, you know, we care about when we talk about energy. Um, the, the other picture is, you know, a sub-zero built environment transfer, transformation in, in Manhattan. So this is they closed down um, Broadway as it goes by Times Square to through traffic, okay? And so this may not, you may not consider this as something that like, oh, civil engineers designed this, but this is infrastructure engineering, has a huge impact on CO2 emissions, and it's a sub-zero CO2 emissions. It's a net negative impact for for emissions, and you know, if you've been there, it actually makes this a more um, enjoyable place. Now, this isn't an appropriate solution for everywhere in the world. The point is, net zero is possible, um, sub zero is possible. For the most part, we're not necessarily like realizing the the full um, potential of opportunities in the built environment. Okay, so I'm gonna like. I have like four iterations of the the research at this intersection of engineering and behavior. So. Um, Perplexed by this issue of, okay, what we're, what's possible is not what's happening. It was trying to study en energy engineering informed by behavioral science. Um, and so the picture up here, I figured I'd reveal this in terms of like, what do you think caused these differences in energy use? So as the graph shows there, you know, this is a percent better than a, than a baseline building. And so the, 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 the leftmost um, data on the plot there, they're saying they're going to do about 30%, 25% better than a baseline building. The middle plot, they're saying, okay, we're gonna do about 50% better than a baseline building. And then the, the right plot is about 40% better than a baseline building. So the difference between like the left and the middle is about 25% energy performance uh, difference compared to a baseline building. And if you like back of the envelope calculation, 25% is about 2.5 gigatons less CO2 per year um, across all buildings and that's, you know, that's a, that's a big chunk uh, of, our, of our challenge here. So this would be a, a massive difference. So what's causing these differences? Um, I'll, I guess I'll reveal some hints. Uh, so what are some things that engineers don't learn at most colleges? I think you get to learn these things at Dartmouth, which is one of the reasons that I'm you know, excited to he be here and talk to you about it. So this is a picture of my Kindle reader. So it shows the things that I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm look at the books that I'm reading. And there's a lot of books on here that are um, behavioral and, and social sciences. I, I became interested in them in the first point because they're kind of the, um, the science behind some of these soft skills that we talk about in engineering. Um, and so this is, this is hint number one. So it's something to do with, the, uh, with these sciences. The point here is that it's, it's more deep and mature than maybe I appreciated as, a, as an engineering undergraduate, where it's, it, there's more to it than just, oh, this is, a, this is a soft skill that you'll learn 20 years down the road in, indus in industry by interacting with people for 20 years, and that's how you'll pick it up. Like, there's, there's a science to these things, and, um, and that science can be, can be used. So that's the first hint. Um, hint number two, as engineers know, and as, or as engineers should know, like this is the whole selling point for our, um, our existence, right, is that these early upstream decisions are more influential and cost less to make. So this is just a, a very simplified graph of as a project progresses throughout, the, throughout its life, um, it becomes harder to make changes and it becomes more expensive to make them. That also means that if, if you're trying to influence things the maximum amount as a as a designer, the you know the the early stages are are very powerful. Um, one of the things that frustrated me in looking at this is that so much of the focus in um, in applying behavioral science and some of these um, some of these ideas was on the downstream decisions, right? So it's like, how do you get humans to turn the light switches on and off, right? Um, and how but what about how do you get designers to design systems that make it so that you don't need to turn the light switches on and off or that use um, natural lighting uh, and reduce the, reduce the need for lighting in the first place. So again, both approaches are needed. There's a lot of focus on one, not necessarily 
the other um, part of it, and there's good reasons. I mean, there, the switch is a very visible part of the energy system, um, and it's the one that people interact with. If you want to study the light switch behavior, there's a lot of instances of that, and you can do nice, clean statistical analyses um, to see that behavior. But um, yeah, turn off the lights, but daylight the office, orient the building the correct way. So how can we, um, how can we move this behavior to these upstream decisions? Okay, hint number three, and this like gives away the answer to why the difference. Um, humans tend to anchor on initial information and then adjust from there, so that's how, um, that's how we make decisions. So this is a classic experiment from um, the behavioral science where they, um, the ultimate, the second question is how old was Mahatma Gandhi when he died, right? And so on, on the, the left column, people say he was 67. On the, on the right-hand column, the average is 50. Um, the initial question was just like uh, an irrelevant prime about Mahatma Gandhi. So of course he didn't live to 140. Nobody's ever lived to 140. And of course he wasn't nine when he died or else he wouldn't, you wouldn't have heard of him. Um, so this, and this works because like the way people make decisions is you say, okay, you've got this initial reference point and you're gonna make an adjustment from there. A lot of times that's helpful, right? A lot of times if the initial rel reference point is relevant, but it can also happen when the initial, initial ref reference point is, is irrelevant and often damaging. So back to, the, um, back to this difference, uh, all the, the only difference was the anchors that we gave to designers, right? So we, we had asked the designers a series of, of questions about um, irrelevant, not irrelevant, but irrelevant to the context of this study, questions about, okay, you're um, priming in their brain 30% reduction in energy use, right? And that was the, the leftmost column. And so with that 30% anchor, when we finally asked them in the last question, okay, you've got this building and it's your big chance, um, you're designing the new, the new school for the School of Engineering, what kind of energy use reduction are you gonna shoot for? They were you know, down around 25%, like close to that anchor. So they had adjusted from that anchor. If you, if you started to ask them a bunch of questions about 90% reduction of energy use, and then finally asked, okay, now what are you gonna do for your building? They were way more ambitious up in the realm of like what's actually possible. Um, so, and even if you set no anchor, they were better than with the 30% with the anchor. Um, so this is, I mean, there's some cool things about the experiment in that it's like real designers. Um, of course, it's simulated questions, but this is not like students in a laboratory or it's not like um, bots on the internet. This was professional designers who were um, registered with the lead system who were influenced in this way by the framing. Um, and so uh, that's a pretty powerful thing. I mean, one limitation of this is it's, it's just five questions. Who knows if that would actually like propagate out to um, to all of the decisions that go into like setting an energy performance goal for a building. The point is it's a, it's a pretty um, powerful and, uh, and simple lever. Um, in, in scientist or like researcher mode, you're kind of just like uncovering this behavior, right? So, oh geez, these unintentional anchors could be limiting energy performance. And if you know anything about the lead rating system, it does set an anchor for energy performance. It's more ambitious than, um, than 30%, but it, it's not really necessary to set an anchor. Um, and then, but then in engineering mode, it's like, well, maybe if we are intentional with our anchors, uh, we could actually enhance energy performance. Um, and that would be a very cost-effective way to do so. So that's example number one. Uh, I think a tip for engineers who are like looking to work in this area, it was incredibly easy to persuade behavioral scientists to, to work with me. They tend to be a very um, welcoming group who are eager to get their, uh, get their insights out into practice, um, and they see engineers as a, as a means to doing that. I've, uh, I, um, the second study I'm about to talk about kind of sprung from this interest in, um, or sprung from stuff that I had read in behavioral science about defaults, and so if you read any of the popular behavioral science books, there's the, it seems like there's an obligation to talk about organ donations. Um, so the thing with organ donations is in the countries like the United States where you have to check a box to say, yes, I will be an organ donor, the donation rates are like, you know, that the exact opposite of countries where you don't have to, um, where you don't have to check a box. So you can check a box to not be an organ donor, right? So this is not about the effort to check a box. You have the option in both cases. Um, there's a little bit of, uh, physical effort, there's a little bit of kind of cognitive effort, but the, the point is like the default, right? The, this is the decision that has been made and to make the other decision, you have to change this initial decision is a, is a very powerful, um, 
a very powerful thing. Um, so, you know, that was me after reading the, the pop psychology and then like the seminal papers. Um, I've been able to collaborate with the, you know, Eric Johnson, who's the guy on the right, and then Elke Weber, who's another of the like leading behavioral scientists in this area. You work directly with them on research because of a mutual interest in like climate change and, and engineering. And one of the, the, um, the, you know, the really, a moment I'll never forget in my collaboration with them is on a phone call and I'm talking about, well, geez, these defaults seem promising. And, you know, you, Eric, you wrote this paper in science about organ donations. That's amazing. And, uh, and he's like, well, actually, there's four channels through which defaults work. Um, and so there's, you know, defaults work because there's a little bit of cognitive effort, right? If you, if you say, okay, now I'm gonna check this box, it forces you to think about like, what am I actually checking here? Um, but then there's also like um, a little bit of implied endorsement, right? So if you, if you don't know anything about a situation and you encounter a box that's already been checked for you, you're like, ah, all right, somebody thought about this and it's a good idea. Or, you know, Microsoft just wants to be able to like spam you with stuff automatically. Um, so, uh, so anyway, there's like these four channels through which defaults work. And if you're trying to like understand the decision making of engineers, you have to understand which of these channels you're trying to target. Um, and, and the point being that um, there's, there's value in reading the papers, but there's also value in working directly with the people. And there's a, I think that there's a, um, a real appetite from behavioral scientists, not just you know the leading ones, but some of the ones you'll meet later in the presentation to collaborate with engineers. So this leads to like engineer research version 2.0. Like if the first version is like okay, looking at this anchoring behavior and how how are things happening is like can we do energy engineering that's actually made better by behavioral science? Right. Um, here's uh, another. Um, output from one of our studies, like what's the difference in achievement? There's a 29% difference in achievement between the two groups here, right? So the mean from 81 to the mean to 112. Um, and this is for uh, infrastructure. Um, so the, the first example was more for like building energy performance. This is for larger scale infrastructure projects. Um, and in this case, across all US infrastructure, 29% better would mean three gigatons less CO2. And that's just for embodied energy in the infrastructure, nothing to do with like the stuff that's moving around on top of the infrastructure. Um, so a scale that makes use of loss aversion explains the 29% difference. So this is a classic, um, one of the most like fundamental new concepts in psychology is like the word basically twice as disappointed to lose something as we are to gain something of the same value. Um, so the experiment that, you know, one of the original experiments, they did it at Cornell, but I used the Dartmouth mug because of the Dartmouth. Um, you, you go into a classroom, give half the students the, the Cornell mug, right? Um, and then you ask, randomly give them half of them the mug. And then you ask the people, ask everybody in the classroom what they'd be willing to either like sell their mug for or buy a mug for. And the people who've been given the mug tend to want to want about twice as much as people who don't have a mug. And the only difference is that you've just been given a mug. Um, and so like, <laughs> we're, we're twice as disappointed to lose something as we are to gain something of the same value. And this is like, turns out to apply in context beyond just um, mugs in classrooms. Uh, so it was like, okay, all of these rating systems, and I don't know if Petra is here, but when I talked to her, she's like, yeah, she pointed out that we grade this way too, right? Um, all these rating systems, you basically start at zero and you, you work your way up to, um, to higher performance. So zero is if you like don't do anything, you do the industry standard and you can get, you know, 12 if you're sustainable and 15 points if you're restorative. What if we just flip the scale around? Nothing about like the, the weighting of the points, but just say, okay, here you are, designer, you got 12 points, you're at the conserving level, you can still do whatever you want. If you do the industry average, you just get minus 12 points, and if you do restorative, you get three more on top of your 12. Just use loss aversion to the scale. Um, that explains the 29% difference. Um, so uh, again, a, a huge impact from uh, a relatively small change. And you know, okay, let's compare this to some other energy investments. The Cash for Clunkers program, um, a really great program by, um, uh, yeah, a really great government program, but saved about 0 0.03 gigatons of CO2 emissions, um, cost about $3 billion. I mean, we should be doing those kinds of investments. DOE's annual budget for fusion energy research, right? The, the benefits still do to be determined. Again, we should be doing these investments, half a billion dollars a year. Infrastructure, the potential here, three gigatons. Um, what's the cost? It's like, uh, I, you know, whatever the time is to change that scale. Um, again, you know, the, <laughs> The hard part here is like, how do you scale this um, and 
you know, it's not like changing this scale is going to immediately apply to all infrastructure. So I'm, I'm definitely taking some liberties there. But the point is that there's, there's a lot of potential um, with these kind of interventions. The bad news, there's, there's a lot of these other things. I mean, I'm kind of getting tired of doing these studies, but they're, they're fun. Um, and, but I mean, they're basically showing that, hey, engineers, uh, the, these same like descriptive norms or these role models or these framing effects that affect normal people also affect engineers. Um, the good news and the thing that I really like about this project is we're fixing them. Um, we're working directly with the, the rating system and you know, so for the next version of the rating system we can do the endowed points example. Um, and then we'll actually be able to, on the scholarship side, you know, study whether that, that behavior that we're finding in these carefully controlled environments is, is extending out to other types of behaviors. Okay, so back to the original question, engineering or behavior. Um, seems like many engineers are behaving like humans. Um, so that's, uh, that's where we are now. Um, so on to the second point. One of the first things I did, and I still think this is an important thing um, for this research, is that this research can improve the outputs of, of engineering models, right? So there's all these models where we like model behavior and, um, you know, it's, we're, Humans are complicated, so if we can be more accurate in how we're modeling human behavior, um, that will be helpful for engineering. And that plugs into all kinds of models from um, you know, how you're programming artificial intelligence to how you're, uh, how you're um, you know, representing community interaction with the grid. And that's, that's important, but I think the bigger thing is like, this, this kind of research can improve the outputs of engineering, period, right? Forget about the models. It's like the engineering itself can be improved by a better understanding of, um, of, the, of the behavioral science. So this is um, probably the most complex slide in terms of the, the things that are on it. But the, the point here is we've done some work just like mapping all of the, the things, mapping onto the basically the engineering design process, um, all of the things that are like uh, recognized and relevant in the, um, in other areas of research. So mainly from behavioral science. Um, recognized in relevant ways to overcome some of these problems that engineers have throughout the design process and some potential research opportunities. And I've tried to like boil them down to, um, this is, you know, there, there's a lot, and I've tried to boil them down to some specific examples. So design thinking, amazing process, right? What's the first step in design thinking? Empathize, and it's great. Yeah, empathize means that, I mean, at least at University of Virginia or, you know, most engineers I deal with, Empathize is like, oh, there's a user, we, get, we now have to consider the user and we have to think about their needs. And that's a really important thing. Um, but people have spent careers studying empathy and like the, the, even just something as simple as the distinction between cognitive empathy, like your thinking empathy and, and emotional empathy, right? So the emotional empathy for the person that you have sitting in front of you who's telling you about their problems versus the cognitive empathy for the million people who might not be represented in that room, but your design still needs to, to help, right? So um, again, I don't know what the answer is to that, but there's a lot that we can learn from those kinds, of, um, those kinds of conversations and the kind of science that's been done in that area. And it's amazing that design thinking has this kind of first step to get people thinking about that, but there's a, a whole lot more that um, we, can, we can learn from empathy. And then, of course, it's not just about like learning about it, but then that gives us ways to do design better, right? So how do you um, kind of be aware of the effects of emotional empathy and like one of the, and ways to overcome stereotypes even like fall in this category, right? So how as designers do we overcome our implicit um, biases um, of, for the people that, that we're designing for. And I think this is especially possible, um, especially relevant when you're talking about these kind of like engaged projects, right, where you're designing for communities who might be very different from, um, from you. Um, and so like the projects that we've done um, on Indian reservations or, you know, bringing water to Haiti, like one of the questions is like, how do we know what they want and need? And even that framing is problematic, right? Because as soon as you say we and they, it's like an in and an out group framing that, um, so it's a, the point is not that there's an answer here. The point is that there is a, a huge opportunity to learn even more and enhance these types of, um, enhance this aspect of engineering. Um, another thing you always hear is like, this is the worst possible, um, the worst eight words in the language, right? Because we have always done it that way as the excuse. And it's used for all kinds of things and you use it for housing developments. Of course we haven't always done it this way. We can do it differently. The example, um, the student, Leon, who's working with me, he's, uh, he's Armenian, and um, 
there's a village that you know he's working in that they still live in the same houses that um, they lived in that were built for them after an earthquake in 1988. So this is temporary housing <laughs> uh, that, and they like it um, in, you know, not in, for different reasons than we would like the housing. So it's become a social norm, this type of housing, right? And so like, how do you learn about social norms and kind of have a scientific way to, to break through this, um, this block that's often there? It's like, because we have always done it this way. Um, Sometimes you just got to go with your gut, right? This is one where there actually has been some progress at the intersection of engineering and behavioral science. So like these heuristics, these decision-making shortcuts that we have. Um, but uh, in basically recognizing the fact that we don't have unlimited time and resources to make decisions, right? Um, we're not going to spend all of our thought process doing a multi-objective optimization model of, of like whether we should turn the light switch on or off. Um, we're gonna just, you know, kind of go with our instincts. So what, um, what heuristics are we using in design? What heuristics um, have direct sustainability implications? Um, how do we engineer complex systems? Do we focus more on the objects or the relationships? Those kinds of things. Um, Two more. Uh, one is like when we're creating the design concepts, this like, hey, we've already invested so much. This is particularly relevant to the grid. It's like, when do we, with these big infrastructure projects, when do we say, okay, let's kind of keep, keep going? And when do we say, okay, let's just scrap the whole thing and start over? Or when do we like starve the worm, to use Elizabeth's term of, uh, you know, kind of doing these strategic interventions around to um, get rid of the, the thing in, in, in the long run? But, you know, fixation has been studied over and over and over again, right? Like how do people fixate on, on certain ideas and how to have additional ideas um, beyond that. Um, one of the things that works really well, both for education and design is analogies, um, and then also salience and, and stories um, tend to help. So there's a lot of potential there. Another one is, this is one we have some kind of preliminary results on that are cool to show. So this idea of like, oh, people will just think about the future. Well, everybody's thinking about the future, right? Nobody intended to create, well, maybe a few people, but nobody intended to create this like climate change situation that, that we're currently in. I mean, everybody, nobody says, oh, I don't care about my kids. That's why I'm gonna take this action. Um, so it's like, okay, how do we actually help people think about the future? How do we think about the future when left alone to our own devices? And then can we help put people in a future mindset to help them make better decisions? And um, Patrick's a student shown here, has done some research. We've uh, given designers uh, basically a, a series of questions and a request for proposals. It's like a page long request for proposals about this project. The only thing we change in the request for proposals is a line that puts them in a kind of a future mindset versus a, a present mindset. And, uh, and the people in the future mindset, when you ask them like, how long did you design this thing for, are sig designing for significantly longer lifespans. Um, and this is like a sentence, this is not some of the, the tools that are available, like Laurie Loeb and um, Talia Wheatley, who are here at Dartmouth, are doing some things with like, how do you provide like visual stimulations and, and simulations that help people envision the future better. Um, so, okay, this question of, if only people would think about the future, there's a lot that we can um, do to, to help with that. Okay, so that brings to like research version 4.0, which, um, I think is fun. So it's an energy engineering that's made possible by behavioral science and the other way around, right? So now if you can have this deep integration across these disciplines, I think there's a lot that engineering and like the study of engineering as a, as a process and as a thought process can contribute back to other sciences. So this story starts with my son, Ezra, and as a two-year-old, we visited San Francisco, the first place on my wife's um, to-do list, I just follow her around on, on vacations, and um, was the, the, um, the waterfront uh, and by the ferry building, and there's a pier there with a Ferris wheel, that's Ezra on the merry-go-round. He, there was people like folding the balloons, and um, he, he got a balloon monkey and was carrying it around, showing it to the seals. So it's this amazing like environment that is pretty much everybody's like first stop place on their trip to San Francisco. Um, so I did some, uh, you know, like looking into the, the background of it, and you realize that it, what it used to look like is the kind of the grayer picture there, and there was this double-decker highway um, over, the, over the waterfront, and there was massive, um, massive resistance to getting rid of that freeway, which was so clearly like a, a detriment to the, to the city. Um, 
what the what happened? Uh, so there's the earthquake world, the the World Series earthquake, right? In 1989, there's an earthquake. It, that's the a, a double decker freeway in Oakland that was some of the worst casualties we're in. It looks exactly like the Embarcadero, same construction approach. Um, the Embarcadero, there weren't as like this, the same number of casualties, and there wasn't the same amount of failure. But it was like really clear, like a double decker highway in an earthquake zone is probably not a great idea. It's also blocking our waterfront. Um, we've also been like trying to get this removed. Herb Cain, this guy is he's a famous um, columnist in the walkway that Ezra and I were on at the time is named after him now. He wrote even after the earthquake that once again they're bringing up this idea of removing the freeway. It's an idea even worse than building it in the first place. Um, so there's still this massive resistance to getting rid of it. Um, and this is a point where it's like, you know, if you can pinpoint one person who's responsible for this project, she's not an engineer. So Sue Bierman was a part of San Francisco's planning commission in this throughout all of this time. And she was just like a community activist and just engaged in like wanting to make her, her city a better place. So she had been, you know, carefully studying the removal of the freeway, the costs and benefits for all of the, um, all of the citizens. Um, and after the, uh, after the earthquake, they finally had enough motivation or enough um, kind of momentum to push this thing through and get the planning commission to vote on it. They didn't have to go to like a popular vote um, among the city, which they probably would have lost and not had been able to remove it. And then after that vote passed, her whole planning commission got voted out of office and a new mayor came in because people were still so resistant to this idea. So, um, and then, you know, 10 years later, it's like hard to find anybody who, you know, 10 years after that, nobody was thinking that this was a bad idea, but it, it took some time. It was hard to remove it. And there are more people involved than just engineers, and yet this is an incredibly important like engineering project. So, I, I mean, there's certainly no one-size-fits-all approach to energy engineering, but my favorites all have like a common theme that is shared by that. Um, or not all of my favorites, but some of my favorites have a common theme that's shared by that uh, that San Francisco example. I don't know if any of you know Anna Keichlein, who's in this picture. She she's like a Dartmouth engineer. She should have gone here, but she went to Cornell instead. She was the first, um, and she did architecture. But uh, she's the first woman architect in Pennsylvania. She served as a volunteer spy in World War One, um, and she <laughs> when she when she like got called for duty in World War One, she said, "Could you give me like something a little more dangerous, please?" Um, and uh, <laughs> so she got to be a spy. Uh, but she's famous for this this middle picture here, which is the K brick. Um, and the, the pioneering part of that brick was like masonry blocks before that, or like the blocks before that had been solid. Okay, so she basically created an air void in the block, which made it um, made it so that it had all kinds of advantages, right? It's lighter, um, it creates a, an insulating space in the block, you can do more complex assemblies with it, and what she did was like take something away from the block that existed before. Um, another example like relevant to energy, if you're talking about like passive design, um, one of the the reasons that passive design works economically is if you can um, kind of create these natural flows and use the natural um, in surroundings and you know solar um, solar exposure to your advantage, you can get rid of the mechanical system. So you're adding and subtracting as, as part of the design. This is the, the New York example that I showed before instead of the, the um, the sky view, it's you know looking at the on, on the actual street, right? And so um, you're you're getting rid of the the automobiles as part of the design um, of the downtown. You talk about uh, distributed um, generation. Part of it, yes, you're adding different points of generation, but you're also able to get rid of the centralized plant. So you have to be able to think about adding and subtraction. Um, so the real, I've always been interested in those ideas, and it's like, why aren't we doing more of those things? Um, then the real epiphany came from Ezra, my son. We we're playing uh, Lego blocks when he was about two. We had, we we're basically building a bridge. So there's a long column and a, a short column, and you know we're trying to span across them. I turn around to get the get a block to put on the small column, of course. And by the time I had turned around, he had taken a block off of the larger column and spanned and made a level bridge. And I'm like, oh, man. Uh, and so that, that's what I'm talking about. And Ezra's a horrible, 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 horrible subtractor. He just like does a lot of things. And this was the one time that he tended, he managed to subtract to take away. So 
and the Lego thing really was a breakthrough because I was able to use that to describe what I was thinking about to the social psychologists that are pictured here. So Gabe Adams, Andy Hales, and Ben Converse, who's a Dartmouth alum, 04. Um, and, uh, and they're like, oh yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. And it's, a basic, it's like arguably a, the fundamental design slash engineering question, right? Where we encounter this situation, are we gonna add something to it? Are we gonna take something away? How are we gonna mix those things together? Um, and so, so we finally had a, a question to ask, and of course, you know, once you start working with behavioral scientists, they're like, oh, well, are you actually sure that we are, um, are overlooking subtractions? We did a bunch of studies. The first one was a, a replica of the Lego project. We asked people to improve the Lego project. Of course, people added more with Legos. I mean, you grow up playing with Legos. Um, we've done this, like, it's complete overkill from an engineer's perspective of, like, the number of studies that we've done to show this, but they, um, it's been an amazing experience working with them. We've studied everything from improving Lego structures to improving an audio loop uh, using uh, uh, Loopamoles. It's a music app, app where you, like, create compositions by dragging and dropping notes, and you can also drag and drop spaces. Um, editing articles, improving a travel itinerary, um, sandwiches, grilled cheese sandwiches. People do not think to take away from grilled cheese sandwiches until you start putting stuff on there like vodka and anchovies. Um, so, <laughs> so this like confirmed was like, guys, this is totally happening, um, that we're like more likely to add than, than take away uh, when we try to improve situations, which is fundamentally what engineers do. Um, and then like it, the, we're trying to figure out, do we do this to our detriment, right? So like the, the Lego-inspired stormtrooper study on the, on the left there, um, the idea behind that one was like, okay, we give them this problem, we're subtracting is clearly the better answer, right? So it's like the task was take the masonry block and put it on top of the, the Lego structure so it doesn't crush, crush the stormtrooper. And if you put it on the way the, the structure is currently set up, um, the, the thing will tip and crush the stormtrooper, so you need to reinforce it somehow. Um, so one approach is to like build a whole row of blocks on that top level. Another approach is to just take away that single block, drop the level down, still protects the stormtrooper, and um, solves the problem. This is like pretty transferable. It applies to stormtroopers. It applies to Batman figures. Um, but it was still like, it's a really like specific example. My favorite is, and I think the most convincing, is these grid studies that we've done, which really strip away the context to show that this is something that we do even if we're not associating like the design with anything else. Um, so we give people these, these grid patterns and there's a couple ways to solve it. Um, you gotta try to match what's on the left. If you look at each of those blocks, uh, each of those grid blocks, there's three separate grid blocks shown there. So the original one there, the task is to try to match what's on the left with what's on the right. Okay, so, so one of the revisions is to add a bunch of blocks and you can get it to match. Another revision is to take away the blocks and you can get it to match. Um, it's, way e it's way fewer clicks to take away. We start incentivizing them, like, okay, you have to pay for each click and they, they still do more. Um, and so it's like, we're, we're, we're not thinking of this. And, and the fun thing um, is like taking that a level further, like why, why aren't we thinking of it? Um, and one of the like most, there's a bunch of things that kind of conclusively show this in our experiments, but the most conclusive one is if you just give people a simple reminder, okay, you can add or you can subtract to solve this problem. That increases the rate of subtractive ideas, but not the rate of additive ideas. So that's evidence that, okay, one of the reasons they're not doing this is not because they don't think it's better, it's just because they're not thinking of it. Um, Certainly, uh, this doesn't explain, you know, there's, a, there's, whereas the other examples that I showed earlier from my research, it's like, this is right in engineering context. Now there's a lot of steps to go from this, like, very fundamental behavior to how we engineer. But I think the bigger question, the bigger point here is, like, if this is happening at this very fundamental thing that we, um, this very kind of core thing about what engineering is, like you encounter in a situation that you're trying to make better and we're more likely to, to approach it one way than another way, like what are all the other things that are kind of underexplored in this area that um, might influence how we're engineering broadly defined, all types of engineering design, but also all types of kind of situations that we're trying to take from existing to preferred in our, our everyday lives. Okay, so of course this doesn't affect scholars, we're smarter than this. Um, 
Actually, no. The, uh, at University of Virginia, we have one of these, we've got a new president, so we're going to do a strategic plan. Um, ours to shape is the, the strategic plan, and um, we got our hands on the data for the ours to shape suggestions. 9% of them suggested taking something away. And yeah, this is a little surprising, because faculty are like really good at being like, we don't need administrators, we don't need all these other things. But still, it's like overwhelming number of additive improvements, so affects scholars at least at Virginia. Um, and of course, it doesn't affect engineering at the highest levels, right? Um, so this was you know, totally thanks to Caitlin, who's a PhD student, and doing, she'll, you'll be hearing more from her in, her in research in this area. And then Clara, who's actually an undergraduate student, like, okay, well, there's, Google has the database of patents, right? And we can like, look through the text of all the patents that have been awarded since Google has, has been uh, keeping track, or has records up. And, uh, so they developed an adding and a subtracting lexicon, right? So like eight different synonyms for adding, eight different synonyms for subtracting, and so okay, like let's look through the patent data and see how frequent these these words are. And again, this is like a really imperfect measure, right? Because it doesn't say anything about like how they were being used. But if you look, um, here's the results. So the subtractive terms are in red, the additive terms are in blue. The subtractive terms are used way less frequently. I think even more interestingly perhaps here, and we don't, we have no idea why this is, is that the, the rate of editing terms is going up, the subtracting terms are, are staying pretty stable. So again, this isn't, on its own, this is just evidence that patent descriptions have a bunch more adding words than subtracting words, but combined with the other um, studies, it's starting to show this picture of like, okay, maybe this is something that's um, kind of a systematic issue. So. My, I implore you all, like, please consider subtraction when you're energy engineering. So this is like, like energy engineering on the grandest scale, right? Is like these these geoengineering or climate engineering approaches, right? Here's a here's a problem with a problem. The issue is so clearly that there's too much CO2 in the atmosphere, and yet one of the leading approaches, which I'm not saying anything about the the relative good or bad or of the different approaches. I think it's important that we like study these things and understand them and have a dialogue as society about them, but. Um, yes, there's approaches that we should take CO2 out of the atmosphere, but even in this, this issue where the problem there's too much of this stuff, one of the leading approaches is like, hey, let's shoot more stuff up there, and um, that by adding to this system, we will um, make it better. And I think if you're looking at this from a complex system standpoint, right, it's just like a, if you add to a system, you're going to introduce more uncertainty, introduce more um, more potential unintended consequences, right? It's like, look what we've done by unintentionally adding or doing something that we didn't think was going to change the environment. Imagine what was going to happen when we intentionally try to change the environment. And so, like, on a completely level playing field and completely abstract, like, view of complex systems, it's probably better to, like, pull things out if you want it to be predictable than to add stuff into it. So. Please consider um, subtraction when you're doing your energy engineering at all different scales. Uh, I've got two slides with the Dartmouth connection, and this is actually a very deep one for me. So Dana Meadows has been like one of my kind of inspirations. She raised this issue of you know the um, <laughs> the, the the tension between this idea that we can grow infinitely physically on a on a finite planet, right? And it's like makes a lot of sense. She wrote Limits to Growth. It's been a a incredible, like one of the best-selling nonfiction books of all time, um, and you know it's an issue. I pulled an article from the New Yorker that it was, you know, from two weeks ago that's still being talked about. And Meadows's point was not that we should not grow. By the way, um, it was that you know we need to to pay attention to this and that there's multiple paths into the future. But there's there's this tension, right? And then the the final figure on the right there is the. Uh, a science article that talked about all these planetary boundaries and where we are on some of them. And, you know, we're past some of the, the planetary boundaries, according to the scientists, right? So this tension between, okay, we all want prosperity. I'm an engineer. I don't want to sit back and, and do nothing and, you know, just kind of like go back to the way things were in the 1920s or whenever people think that um, this, this wasn't a problem. But, like, how do we decouple this pro prosperity from from physical growth and like subtraction and is is, in a, is a potential way to do that right if we can think about like taking away to make things better that kind of solves this issue another Dartmouth connection um, this I I didn't realize how many people have dealt with this idea but so like Charles Mann wrote this really great book that um, 
called The Wizard and the Prophet. So he wrote 1491 and 1492, um, but he, uh, The Wizard and the Prophet is basically about this history of tension between like very well-meaning people who want to make the better world a better place. This isn't like climate change deniers. This is, the wizards are the like Norman Borlaugs of the world, right? The, the, the green revolution and, you know, feeding a whole bunch of people. Yes, that's brought environmental problems, but he saw this as the, the way to advance technology to, um, to make the world a better place for, for humans. And then the prophets are more like a little bit more on like kind of like doomsayer side. Um, things are, are going really bad. We've got to, um, we got to be very cautious and, um, be very practical about this. Infinite growth on a finite planet is impossible. So this is like a long-standing tension. John McPhee is one of the best nonfiction writers of all time. Actually talked about this in the summer of 1971 um, in Encounters with the Archdruid, and he uses the word the prophet in there, and so like man borrows from him. But it turns out the Lorax, um, the Lorax is the total the Lorax as a person, not the book, or a, 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 an animal character, not the book. Is a uh, is a prophet, and the, the Onceler is a wizard, right? So Dr. Seuss was very early on this argument. The Onceler is not, if you read that very carefully, the Onceler is not necessarily a bad person, right? So the story of the Lorax is the, the Onceler comes to this really nice truffle of valley and um, takes down the, uh, ultimate, like takes down the, the truffle of trees to make this product for humans, and eventually the valley goes, um, goes downhill and isn't useful anymore. And, uh, and the, the Wensler is left in his, um, in his house or in his tree hut wondering what all went wrong, right? And, but, but if you listen to what he's talking about, he was just trying to like build the economy, provide jobs for his family. Um, and so, so Dr. Seuss in the very beginning was actually talking about this tension between, um, between wizards and prophets and that subtraction could be a way to like apply these wizardly tendencies that engineers have in a prophetic way. Um, so again, you know, back to this core question, uh, engineering, um, it shouldn't be engineering or behavior, it's engineering and behavior, right? Engineering is human behavior. Um, and the, uh, to think this requires an interdisciplinary and human-centered approach to engineering, right? So I think if, if anybody's going to do this, it needs to be, um, Dartmouth needs to be at the center of this. So I, I appreciate the work that you're doing in this area. And I think, again, the motivation for kind of merging these two things is because I think our, our energy future depends on it. So thanks for listening. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.